In our very first story, the national chairman of the opposition National Democratic Congress, Sam Olufosu Apofu, has been granted bail after being slapped with four charges in connection with the leave take saga. He is either insisting he never uttered the remarks attributed to him on that tape. We're going over live to our correspondent, our reporter, uh, Kwesi Paka Wilson, who's standing by uh, at the police headquarters where Mr. Fusu Ampofu was released a short while ago. Now, Parker, uh, what can you tell us? I know that the NDC, well, members, supporters of the National Democratic Congress, masked up at the police headquarters for a while, waiting for the release of the national chairman, of their national chairman. Eventually, he was released. But what do we know as being the charges? Hi, so um, four charges, um, we are told. And the first one is threat of harm. The second is conspiracy to commit harm. The third charge is rioting. And the fourth charge is assaulting public officials. So these are the four charges leveled against the someone of the NDC, someone of the And as you rightly mentioned, the government never admitted to the voice. In fact, in the interrogation room, the audio was played to him. And he was asked whether he would concede that that is his voice. In response, he told the CID official that he doesn't comment on Dr. Tate. And so he's not going to comment on that. A few hours on, um, the CID official, uh, I mean, the NDCP, the NDC uh, lawyers and uh, some of the some of his lawyers actually secured a bill for him. Now, when he was addressing the party supporters, he made it clear that he is the man of peace and that he has no intention to uh, uh, actually incite any way of to cause mayhem in the country. We can listen to him. For, first of all, let me give thanks to the Almighty God. This is the day the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be grateful to the good Lord. And to also thank our teaming party supporters for keeping faith with leadership and for sparing your time to be here to give us this kind of support. I want to appreciate it and to assure all of you that your chairman, the NDC chairman, is a man of peace. I have been in politics for the past 30 years. There is no iota or there is no record that any insult has ever proceeded out of my mouth. No. I have led the party and we have always come out peacefully in all that we do. Yes. My decision in the recent by-election at Ayawasu West Wagon indicates that I'm a very peaceful person. Very peaceful man. Because I will want to protect life and property than political gain. The are walking free. I want to assure all of you and also to thank them the police officers, that they have handled us professionally. Yeah. And we believe that yeah. any yes. that they will do yes. a very professional job. Yes. I want to assure all and sundry that we will not undermine the peace and stability of this country. But we will not own doctored messages. We still want to remain that whatever has been put out there in several forms or shapes, are doctored to undermine the party. I want to end by thanking everybody and to assure you that we will continue to be law-abiding party, we will continue to, be, to, to observe the rule of law, and we will continue to champion, to champion our quest for winning 2020. As your chairman, as your chairman, prevent us from going ahead to win 2020 and from the... Well, Chrissy Parker will sing is still on the line. Now, do we have... Have we had any other reaction from the party apart from what the national chairman has had to say? Yes, of course. I mean, the lawyers have been speaking. Some executives have also been speaking. Now, the deputy 
general secretary of the party that is Peter Wama or the corner. But he says that the government is actually focusing on triviality. Following the announcements that Chairman of the National Democratic Congress, Mr. Samuel Obusuampofo, had been granted bail, scores of the supporters here are tending to uh, disperse from here. They've been here all day since 8.56 a.m., I can tell you. At the announcements that he has been granted bail, a lot of them are dispersing. And a short while ago, we heard him speak to the crowd here. Let's speak to Peter Otokuno, who is a Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. Let's hear him out now. He is, he is one of the general, deputy general secretaries of the NDC. Let us pick his thoughts on exactly what he makes of all that's been happening all day. Power rotates, and power will rotate in 2020. They should be careful. Whatever they do today, the seeds they sow today will come and germinate, grow, and it will bear fruit, and it will come hunting them. And what message that they sent to your party, especially because of this leak tape and all the brown hand that has come? The message he sends to our party is that we should even be more united and solidarize with ourselves and become stronger because they, they are our opponents. They are not joking. The enemy is not joking. It is in to alienate us. So we should also prepare. Remain strong, remain resolute, remain together, and be able to secure power from them. You cannot use power capriciously like this. That is not what power is made for. People are suffering in this country. People are hungry in this country. The dollar is on the loose. Then you focus on trivialities like this. You cannot stay in power for the next four years. Now, Kwesi, have we also heard from the supporters of the National Democratic Congress who were, were told masked up at the party, at the CID headquarters? The party were excited for the release of their chairman because this morning, it shall have been, have been with them and they have always indicated that, listen, they want their chairman to be released else they were going to actually take the process. So when they hear the announcement, they were excited and some of them we spoke to clearly indicated to us that what has happened is an indication that the NDC is going to regain power in 2020. I left Olubo at 4 o'clock with the first bus, and I reached here around 10 o'clock in, in the morning. Yeah. Okay, and you've been here since I've till now. I've been here since a, 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 up to now. And now you had the announcement that he has been granted bail. Yeah, so yeah. what are you doing from here? Oh, yeah, I'm going back to Olubo. Yeah, I'm going back to Olubo now. Now I'm free. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you are satisfied that um, yeah, the man has been released yes, on bail I'm now? I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied that my, my national chairman has been released or has been granted bail. But any time, any day that they call him back, I will be here again. You leave your business and your family and everything and come here? Yes, I'm all the way from Olubo. Okay. Yeah. Did you also travel from Olubo? No, I'm coming from North Kanishi. Okay. Yes, I'm the youth organizer of Okaikwe South. And I'm here to support my chairman who has been, for no reason, been brought here. But thank God he has been released and we are all happy. And this shows that in 2020, we are winning power. We are not going to sit down for these people to do whatever they want to do. Some NDC sympathizers here who have come around to uh, sympathize with the chairman of the National Democratic Congress, who is Mr. Samuel Ufusu and they are dispersing now because essentially the man has been free. They had said that they were going to stay here all night uh, if it meant that their chairman was still in custody at the CID headquarters all night, but it appears it's all done now. Everybody is moving to their various houses. I must say that they left their businesses, left their families and everything and came here to show that solidarity to their chairman. Moving on to other stories, and a resident of La Bawaleshi who witnessed the violence that marred the Ayawasu West Wogong by election has blamed the National Security SWAT unit for gunshot injuries suffered by persons in the constituency on January 31. National Security Minister Kandapa, in his testimony before the Justice Short Commission, stated the unit had fired only six warning shots, which did not injure anyone in the process. Benjamin Tego, however, told the commission more than two persons were hit by the shot. Security analyst Dr. Kwesi Enning and General Secretary of the governing New Patriotic Party were also at the commission to speak about the phenomenon of political party militias. There's more in the following report. 66 Bench, Al-Qaeda, Al Jazeera, NATO forces, Rasta boys, Sisi group, Invisible forces, Bamba boys, the existence of political party militias have been identified as the root cause of the violence that marred the by-election. 
President Akufuado, during the State of the Nation address, asked that the two leading parties meet to decide steps to dissolve the violent groups affiliated to them. Dr. Enin, however, believes it may take more than that. These groups have become economic groups. They've been infiltrated by criminals. They have evidence, recorded statements of those who promised them goodies. He argues it's important for confidence in the security agencies to be restored. We shouldn't be shy as a nation to say, probably the UN should come and help play the honest broker or the African Union. Operators of the national security have been accused of being responsible for the violence and multiple gunshots that characterize the election. Dr. Enin wants the states to pay attention to what appears to be a trend of handing weapons to national security operatives. The governing MPP, whose candidate won the by-election, has been accused of owning vigilante groups whose members have been absorbed into state security apparatus. General Secretary John Buedu, however, told the commission the groups are sometimes beneficial to the party. I personally, if I had not had the services of these young men with me on that day, because we were all running with the police to, to take over, it would have been catastrophic. I wouldn't know what would have happened. He wants the police to remain firm in enforcing the laws of the country once political parties disband their vigilante groups. The security agencies to assert their authority. There's a need for them to be fair and firm. The commission has so far been told a number of empty bullet shots have been obtained from various individuals with the police still making efforts to retrieve some more. Detective Sule Jalo, who on Friday led the commission on the top of the crime scene, says all pieces of evidence have been forwarded to the police forensics department. Certain pieces of evidence at the shooting site. And forwarded same to the divisional crime officer. Various witnesses who have testified before the commission have given conflicting accounts on a number of gunshots that could be attributed to the SWAT unit. National Security Minister Kandapa had told the commission his men fired only six warning shots and did not injure anyone. The, uh, our boys then gave some six warning shots, which they tell me did not hit anybody. Benjamin Tego, an eyewitness, disagrees. One guy, one man, young man, had it on the leg. I think on the, I don't know whether the right or the, le the left leg. And then one had it on the shoulder. The other one received it by the waist. And there was this other young guy. He's very young. The bullet entered into, I mean, his head, his hand. The commissioner ever had some questions. Yes, my they were Lord. just firing by heart. The way they were firing. Yes, yes. and yet it didn't hit anybody hey. to cause death. No, death didn't come in. The commissioner will continue with its proceedings on Tuesday. Now, police reinforcement was rotting to beef up security at the Asokwa District Court in Kumase, where three suspects in the fatal shooting at the NDC regional office two weeks ago were arraigned. Agitated relatives of Abdul Wasiu, who died in the incident, masked up at the court and attacked sympathizers of the suspect before and after proceedings. The court denied bail to the three who pleaded not guilty to a charge of conspiracy to commit murder, having turned themselves into police late last week. And Al Juma has more in the following report. People had to be set before being allowed into court four, presided over by his lordship Abbas Muhammad. Family of the late Abdul Wasiu, who was shot dead by elements within the NDC militia group, Hawks, vented their anger at party supporters at the court. They allege some party members who turned up at today's proceedings have since the killing of their relatives sought to defend suspects in their utterances. Dizid's brother, Mohamed Tanku, justifies the action. After killing our brother, we have somebody who called my sister, threatened my sister that she is going to kill my sister like they will kill my brother. So even as they are here, they are threatened with people, so we don't want to see them. 
So you think the police have been unfair to you? They are unfair to us. They have to arrest them. You want to arrest them? Because they know, they know where the rest are. They know where they are. Who knows? The police people. They know where the rest are. They know where the rest are. So that's to go arrest them. Prosecution told the court the three and others who at large had gone to the party office with arms to settle scores with party tax force, another militia group. Defense counsel Evans Amankwa, however, disagreed. He explained one of the suspects, Ibrahim Dauda, is a deputy constituency youth organizer for NDC in Tafu Pankrono and Raja Security Committee member. Mr. Amankwa suggested Dauda had been invited by the NDC regional chairman, Nana Akwesi Augustus, to a meeting at the party office. He said the suspect was supposed to attend the meeting with members of the Hawks, hence the presence of another suspect, Samuel Ejay. The lawyer further indicated the third suspect, Abdul Ghanil, wasn't at the party office on the day of the shooting. He therefore pleaded for bail for his clients, which the court refused and remanded into police custody to reappear on the 14th of this month. You see, the fact of the matter is that this is something that has happened. And nobody is happy with that, not at all. But the people that have been arrested, if you, if you, if you read the facts, they have no connection whatsoever with uh, the offense that was committed. And we have the opinion that one, they have no inclination to the offense that was committed, they should have been granted bail. And it is the police that will take a position on that. Uh, sorry, it is the court that will take a final decision on that. So what are you, you and your clients, what are you doing to assist in investigation? We, 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 would, we would be able, we would be available if the police wants any further questioning. Also, the prime suspect in the Takarade kidnapping of three females, Samuel Udotek Wills, was on Monday attacked by the victim's relatives when he appeared in court. Several months after the ladies disappeared, the police are yet to establish what has become of them, citing the refusal of the prime suspect to cooperate, except for taking them on wild goose chases. Join us in Nathalia Kwanza reports the suspect abandoned his slippers in a bid to escape the wrath of the agitated relatives. This is the fifth court hearing into the investigation of the three missing girls who were kidnapped allegedly by the Nigerian Samuel Udotek Wills. The courtroom was packed as residents besieged a story building housing the court. A room that could house not more than 60 was crowded. Others stood along the staircase and around the court building. Before his worship Michael Lampedu would appear to start proceedings, Udotek was attacked. Mother of Ruth Quayson, whose daughter went missing on December 4, 2018, confronted the suspect, hurling insults and demanding her child. This was the first time Ruth's mother appeared in court since proceedings began. Father of Prisla Bentum, who went missing on August 12, 2018, followed up behind the suspect and knocked him on the head. <laughs> We cannot give a lawyer or some to take a lawyer on our behalf. So the state should give us an attorney representative, whoever he is, to be on the case so that he will, call, he will talk on our behalf. This is my, my, my work. Yes, I want time to say, yeah, but run away. We are tired of the excuses. This is not helping us at all. We are scared while on our way. Because why are we here? We are here. In the face of all this, the suspect Udotek looked calm. The court heard Samuel Udotek Wells led the police to arrest a suspect named Koda in the eastern region. According to Udotek Wells, the suspect is key to finding one Kwesi, another suspect who the magistrate on February 18 ordered the police to produce in court. Lead lawyer for the parents, Nana Abeka, spoke to newsmen after the proceedings. I think that looking at the, 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 the nature of the case, uh, we need a representation, for legal representation for the 
families or the parents whose children are the victims of this incident. Um, we are touched by the development. Of course, by now, we, we thought that the, 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 the truth, in fact, investigation should have reached a level which would reveal you know, the uh, whereabouts of these children. The case was adjourned to April 4. Now, we've also been speaking with Gender Minister Cynthia Morrison, who previously gave assurances that the girls will be found soon. She has been speaking with my colleague, Gifty Ando, up here. The first time we spoke to you at Joy, you said that we're closing in on these people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have said that you, 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 you said that without, with, with, without really giving us a lot of information as to what that really means. Because I can't give the information. I'm not the security expert. They are working on it. And the corporates are watching. They watch TV. They listen to the news. So if you give your information out there, it's like you're giving it to them. Okay. They are still working on it. I spoke, I've spoken to them. They are, they, are, they are working on it. And this morning you were again in the news yeah. uh, uh, saying, saying that it gives you sleepless nights. I've of heard, course. I, I've, heard, I've heard some people give a feedback to your sleepless nights comment and they say, if the minister is, is, is having sleepless nights, how should of, we feel? If it is my child and she's not back, what do I do? Uh, but, do they, I, but they're saying that you have the, the power to act. To arrest the, the person? No. Or to, to do what? To, to, to tell me what to do. To okay, tell me. On the security agency I'm doing. Get, to act. I'm doing, so you tell me what I can do. No, that's why we pay you. And you're also paid, so I'm asking you, no, you're I, a journalist. I, 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 you I, I, also I, I, are Raven Mysteries, you're, you're, you're a journalist. Exactly, exactly, but this is your job. I am working, I am not a security, I don't no, have so to bring the girls us, back. You tell us your job, tell us what My you're My job doing. is to make sure that human beings are safe. Okay. I, the security is working on it, and I'm to, I've told you, I can give their information. But where are we? Where are we as far as that investigation? I won't tell you, they are working on it. You can go, I can give you Madam Tiwa's number. You call her from here and she'll tell you exactly um, what they've read. If they want to give you the information, that will be from the security. But from my end, it will be so wrong to tell you exactly what they're doing because the people are also watching. Okay, so, so, so the point is that there won't be a lot, a lot of information out there because... Uh, oh, no, I didn't say that. I said you can call Madam Tiwa. Mm. She is the right person. The CID. So I'll yeah. give you the number. You call her and then she'll tell you. Okay. It, it We're taking a break here on Joy News Prime, but still ahead, we bring you business news where the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation says it intends to use the Bhutan Basin to become a standalone oil drilling company. Do stay tuned. In. We intend to use the Bhutan Basin. Currently, we are doing it alone because GMPC is controlling all the processes. And then later on, the extended family system, which once so beautifully provided the social safety net, but the less privileged in society is gradually being done away with in favor of individualism. Hundreds of people show up at my wedding giving me instructions on what to do and what not to do just because somehow I'm related to them. And you didn't know them at all? I have no clue where they came from, but they claim they are my family members and I should listen to what they are saying. We explore the phenomenon as part of our Ghana Month commemoration. Stay tuned. The National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, says it is putting measures in place to ensure the impact of any imminent earthquake is minimized. Residents living in several parts of Accra on Saturday, March, to experience an earth tremor, which the Geological Survey Authority has described as a moderate earthquake. The authority is warning the frequent earth tremors being experienced in parts of Accra is sufficient caution for residents in earthquake-prone areas to be alert and prepare for a major one. And CMA Fajradozi has more in this report. January this year, a magnitude of tremor that occurred was put at 2.6. In February, it increased to 2.8. Just two days ago, another earth tremor occurred, recording 3.9, something officials at the Ghana Geological Survey Authority have described as a moderate earthquake. They are warning residents in earthquake-prone areas to be alert and prepare for a major one. As for a bigger earthquake, one day it will, it will, it will come. But as to when, it's always the problem that seismologists have not been able to unravel. So what we always keep saying is that build resilience, take advantage of what you are having, then, then, then 
look at your areas where these things are happening. Those who are living it directly on the fourth line, it's recommended that they don't build on this. And it is an international accepted. For now, we can even look at uh, Guija, Makati, yeah, that, you know, that stretch of uh, mountain. Mm. Yeah, that stretch of mountain where people have developed on. That's where I fear it, because it is around this. That mountain also defines our weak zone or our fault line. As we await the earthquake, Authorities are warning about the lives of thousands of Ghanaians that are at risk as it appears we still do not have an effective monitoring system. In December last year, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Kweku Asumatreme, noted steps were being taken to install solar power systems at the Ghana Geological Survey Authority Earthquake Seismic Observatory to effectively monitor earthquake readings. Power outages, power outage continues to hamper earthquake monitoring in the country. In order to carry out the 24-7 monitoring of earthquakes in Ghana, government has approved the installation of solar power at the Authority Earthquake Systemic Observatory. News, however, is that President Ekufuado has put the national security and the Ministry for the Interior on alert for a possible earthquake. The president has asked the two agencies to prepare for a national earthquake emergency plan that will minimize its impact if it occurs. Speaking to Joy News, Deputy Director General of NADMO, Abu Ramadan, says his outfit is putting measures in place to ensure that the impact of any imminent earthquake is minimized. We, we are putting measures, enough measures in place to be ready for but, but what about public education? It has started. Uh, we started last year. We really have the simulation. If you, if you know the way our structure works, not most structure we have uh, we, we are all the way down to the zonal level. So we, we tax areas that are uh, uh, have to flow. The direct the community to, to, to start some form of sensitization within those communities. And, and I believe I believe the sensitization have, have been going. Now we need to blow it up to make, make it things good. So so hopefully next week we will be here. Then we will be coordinating with other agencies, responsive agencies to put together proper communication and an education plan so that we can roll out that education plan uh, here. Now, a mother is stuck in the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital in the central region for ignoring the husband's warning not to seek medical care for their child whose limbs were getting rotting by the day. The husband had warned her not to return home with the 11-year-old boy unless she confesses she is a witch for choosing to send him to the hospital rather than seek spiritual intervention. Join us as Richard Kujinyako reports not even the intervention of the gender minister would make the husband rescind his decision. Eleven-year-old Ephraim Donko lies on his hospital bed with his toes and fingers cut off. His toes, fingers and all his joints were getting rotten. He's been sent from one spiritual center to the other for help by his dad, but the condition started deteriorating. Ephraim can neither walk nor touch anything. Into other way, you know, patient will to check. Into what channel night, no now so ban way to training in if you wanna. Then I ask no so way to training in and to see the other way. Then I be in. When we came to the hospital, all his hands and feet were rotten. They had to cut the toes and fingers. For the four months we've been here, he's not called us. He's told us not to come home. Until I confess I'm a witch and responsible for my son's condition. Mother of Ephraim, a mother of 10 by the same husband, decided to save the son's life by sending the child to the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital when part of the boy's body started getting rotten. This act of the mother has incurred the wrath of the husband, who has accused the wife of being a witch and behind the boy's condition. Medical officials here at the pediatric unit of the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital say the boy is suffering from a medical condition. 
and if he had been brought earlier to the hospital, the fingers and the toes wouldn't have been cut. Doreen Levanta is a staff nurse here. Actually, the boy is having a, a condition, they said, or a vasculitis. That's ulcers all over the body, and we are managing. Actually, they actually have a financial constraint because the mother said she doesn't have anybody supporting. So it's been benevolent people who have come, and then a lot of friends and family who they don't know. Gender Minister Cynthia Morrison, who visited the hospital and got appalled by the situation, phoned the dad of the 11 year old boy. All the fingers were dead, so they had to cut it, them off. And I, I took the number of the husband and called him. And he's like, I am not coming because I didn't ask my wife to bring him to the hospital. And he's telling me, Madam Ness, I won't come. The woman is a witch, let her tell you why the child is here and all that. And if she is a witch, she's still here with your son. And this thing, according to the nurses and the doctors, he's healing. When he came, it was so bad. But even looking at this, this looks like the worst case to us. And they are telling us he's, too, he's improved. Both mother and child have been at the hospital for the past four months and are living on the benevolence of people. Richard Kwejunyako, Joy News, Cape Coast. Now, traditionally and for centuries, Ghanaians have considered the extended family a critical part of their lives. Individuals felt a sense of responsibility towards the extended family and supported relatives in need by paying their bills, seeing them through school and attending to their other needs. All that is changing now as people are becoming more individualistic and limiting their responsibilities to their nuclear family. Daniel Dazi explores the phenomenon as pertains to Akan culture in our Ghana Month series. In the past, where communal living was common, caring for a child was a shared family responsibility. But a lot has changed today. A lot of people do not look beyond the nuclear family, father, mother, and siblings. So sometimes, the extended family is considered a nuisance. Hundreds of people show up at my wedding, giving me instructions on what to do and what not to do, just because somehow I'm related to them. And you didn't know them at all? I have no clue where they came from, but they claim they are my family members and I should listen to what they are saying. Meet Mamiefua, a 23-year-old newlywed who says her wedding day was marred by her extended family. Mame is from Kromanting in the central region. And though extended families are an important part of Akan culture, she grew up with a single mother. You know, most of the times it's just the two of us. You and your mother? Yeah, my mom and I. So there was no one else to give you instructions? No, no, I wasn't expecting any other person to say any other thing, apart from my mom. She is not alone. Research by a doctoral candidate in the University of Ghana Department of Social Work carried out in 2014 found that the traditional family is undergoing some transformations from the traditional extended family to a modernized nuclear family. For Tufuhini of the Akwemu traditional area, Nana Ofe Ibuedu, that's where the problem begins. This, for me, is creating a lot of problems to our society now. One, it is likely that you can go out and meet your own brother and be dating. We see ourselves at, as each other's keeper. For instance, if you talk, talk about the uncles, they are in charge of the children. They are, as a matter of fact, making sure that they discipline and then they train the children in the house. So you being the father in the house, even though you are the head of the, of the family, um, the uncles control because if they die, it is your children that are going to succeed them. Mami, however, believes in spite of the extended family system's benefits, it's not relevant for modern society, especially the matrilineal mode of inheritance for her Akan people. I don't even understand how it works. Professor Albert Awedoba of the University of Ghana Lagos Institute of African Studies can help. Well, you see, there's an argument that uh, once upon a time, uh, a certain chief found himself in a, a certain situation, he needed to redeem himself. And he could best redeem himself by pawning a relative. So he decided to uh, take one of his children to be used as 
a pawn to redeem himself. Okay? And then his wives objected to that. So he went, he couldn't get his way because the wives were not in favor. Now, he went to his sister, and the sister had no objections. So the, children, the sister allowed him to uh, deploy one of her children as the pawn. So thereafter, he then took an oath, swearing that from that day onwards, uh, his property would be bequeathed to his uh, sister's children rather than to his own biological children. But then the, 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 the paradox is this, the, 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 the contradiction is this. In a strictly in a strictly patrilinear society, that is, you are assuming that this society was patrilineal before it moved on and became matrilineal. In a strictly matrilineal, patrilineal society, it's not possible for the mother to deny the father's right to do with his children as he sees please. Because the children uh, belong more with the father than with the, with the mother. So if you are saying that the mother in this case could prevent this from, from happening, okay? It is rather the sister who was able, but, but that sister, is it a possible that sister had a husband? And if the sister had a husband, where was that husband? And the husband allowed this to happen. Of course, it's possible that the, 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 the sister didn't have any husband at all. Has the legend simply fallen flat in the face of logic and critique? Prof believes it's a much simpler phenomenon. Money now rules everything. People are now realizing the importance of whatever it is, the, money, the monetary value of that. And they are not willing to part, okay, with that in favor of uh, their relatives.